with Danny. Um, Professor uh, Danny Burns, um, you are Professor at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex. And previously, um, when, when I knew you quite well, co-director with Susan Weil of SOLAR at the University of the West of England. And SOLAR stands for Social and Organisational Learning as Action Research. And, um, and I very much associate you with, with systemic action research and have your, have your book here from 2007, which is, um, is a very, uh, very worthwhile and good read. So lovely to see you again, um, Danny. Nice to see you too. Um, so I wanted to, I know that we held um, a similar view of what it means to say the world is complex just from talking to you and, and reading what you've written and that that worldview underpins your approach to systemic action research and participative action inquiry. And I, I think what's, what's great about your approach um, it, is that it gives a way of exploring the complex world for real in the flesh, not via models and, or concepts. But I wonder if you could explain what systemic action research, participative action inquiry are. Yeah, no, happy to do so. I mean, I think, um, as you'll know, action research itself and participatory action research have a long history. And essentially, they're around, um, they're built around an assumption that uh, stakeholders, if that's the right word, have knowledge, um, can find the right questions that they need to uh, uh, engage with in order to answer some of the problems that they face or whatever it is that they want to in inquire about. Um, and action research has, has always been a method by which people can um, both learn from their collective sense making, but also learn from the action that evolves from that collective sense making. Mm -hmm. And that in turn, uh, sort of iteratively, then feeds back into the, 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 the sense making process. So there's a sort of interaction between action and, and uh, sense making and knowledge generation processes. So systemic action research, I guess, is then layering into that um, a, f a few things. I think it's looking at systems and complexity um, through at least two directions. One is to say that if you're going to create change in the world, then you need to think about what are the sort of the patterns and the dynamics um, which are driving the issues and the problems that you're facing. Now, of course, in a complexity-based um, construction, that's, that's, that's difficult in its own right because complexity thinking really says that there, there is no linear pathway from you know, a, a, a pattern which may or may not repeat itself mm -hmm. into you know, a straightforward solution. Nevertheless, I think you can start to tentatively map from the reality, you know, what are the directions of travel? Uh, what are some of the triggers that are creating certain types of outcomes? Um, where are the points where things start to amplify in ways that you wouldn't otherwise have predicted unless you saw that? Yeah. Um, and then what can you learn from that? So in a sense, it's saying you're not going to get transformative change unless you change the system dynamics. Yeah. Um, and a lot of action research really was focused on here's a problem, solve it. But actually, the problem then became replicated because you're not really focusing on the underlying dynamics which are, are pushing it. Yeah. No. Um, but I think the other side of this, Jean, just to add to this, is that... Um, it's also about saying that in order to be able to, to engage with you know, what we might call whole system change, bearing in mind that we can only ever interact with little bits of the system that we can see, we need to engage all of the actors in that system. And we need to engage at multiple points within the system. So it's not enough just to have an action research group here. We've got to have action research groups and learning processes, you know, up the hierarchy horizontally with different stakeholders and actors, connect them, uh, look at what the emergent learning is through those connections. If you're going to create change across a wider system, then you need to engage the wider system. Mm, no. Uh, Brilliant, thank you. So there's a real emphasis on empowerment, participation, not doing to, but doing with. Um, 
an, an emphasis on taking action, the kind of iterative process between action and learning, but, but with a focus as much on action as on learning. It's kind of trying to get, get somewhere or people, the mm. participants to get somewhere. And then this, this point about emergence that we, we have to, in a sense, follow what changes. We can't predict entirely what changes, but we have to be there and follow it and learn from that. Yeah, and then so you're just on that one, I think it's but worth saying something um, which I've thought for a long time, which in a sense is that action research as a as a model mm -hmm. is very resonant with the whole concept of iterative change, which is mm -hmm. within the complexity uh, world, because essentially, you know, we start off with some sort of meaning making process. We meet mm -hmm. whatever that intentional group is that is mm -hmm. coming together and then it takes action and then it figures out okay, well, what happens as a result of that action? Yeah. Um, so it looks at the world anew. It said, do we need new people? Do we need new methodologies? Yeah. Do we need to challenge our assumptions again? Do we need to see this through a different lens? Now let's take another step. Yes, yeah. Um, and so on. So, you know, and that may go on for like 10 or 15 or 20 cycles over two years. So the, the, the actual structure of an action research methodology is very resonant with the, with the concepts that underpin complexity. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I think the other point you made, which is, is about the systemic aspect of it, that, that you can't limit yourself to, to doing this bit. It's, it's about being willing to work over scale and, and in a sense to call in, you know, well, we need more people here. We need to get up to the hierarchy there. We need to go outside and talk to those people in this way. So it's, it's, it's not, you know, obviously you can't talk to everyone in the system and, and what is a system anyway, but you use your nose and, and mm -hmm. the outcomes that happen to keep, um, in a sense, being prepared to expand into where are um, important people, important issues, and how do we draw that in? Is, um, is I think that's a, a good, hopefully a summary of what you were saying. You know, it's a really exactly. important issue, isn't it? To think systemically, to not be limited by your own notion of boundaries, but to let the boundaries present themselves to you in a sense through Which the research. Yeah, no, great. Mm. So another point that I think you, you really make and is a really important point to make is, is about purpose that um, I always feel you, you emphasize, as do many people in the action research community, that you, you're wanting to work for the purpose of positive social change. It's not just interesting or, or in, in service of anything. It is in service of, of some kind of um, future positive um, change uh, that, that impacts a lot of people. But uh, do you have any sort of, um, you know, case studies or little stories you could share with us to give us some examples of how you've used these ideas in practice? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you, I could give you uh, two quite different examples. Mm -hmm. um, both have used a sort of a similar methodological process, which starts with life stories of people who are within a particular context. So one which I was working on with uh, um, colleagues um, and partners in, in India, um, uh, was focused on slavery and bonded labor. Um, and we collected with local communities and with some local NGOs around 300 life stories. And then we built a, a, a workshop where the slaves and the bonded laborers themselves analyze the story. So our philosophy is always to support people. It doesn't matter whether they're literate or non-literate, we'll, we'll find the tools for them to analyze the stories. Um, and without going into the detail of the methodology, multiple stories come together and through those emerges a pattern. Mm -hmm. And one of the patterns that we noticed was, um, went something like this, that very poor families who have no money at all, they have a health, they, they frequently had health crises. I mean, of course, that's a natural thing that happens in the world, but maybe even more so for people that are more vulnerable because of their poverty. They have a health crisis and they have no money. So they have to borrow money in order to pay for it from a, a money lender who charges very high interest rates. I mean, extortionately high interest rates. They can't possibly pay it back because they're slaves and bonded laborers. They don't have any money. The only way that they pay it back is they give their child to the money lender to work in the city or work somewhere else for three years. 
So that child then works in a tea shop or somewhere 16 hours, 17 hours a day for six days a week, seven days a week, indefinitely for three years. And of course that child gets ill. Um, and so the family then has to find more money for health expenses. And you see that, you know, almost like that feedback loop just going round and round and round and round until the family is just, you know, devastated and no longer can function. So when we begin to see that pattern emerging in multiple stories with very different variants, then the groups can dialogue that and talk it through. But what became really clear is that all of the NGOs that are working on slavery and bonded labor, they're thinking about education, they're thinking about um, rescuing uh, bonded laborers and, and they're thinking about linking them to public services and so on. But nobody was thinking about health. Health was the trigger. So to be able to spot the trigger, which is, you know, uh, creating the problem, it doesn't mean that you've got an automatic solution. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that there is an, there's a direct relationship between that pattern and the intervention, but you reorient yourself. Mm -hmm. And so the NGOs can then start to say, okay, we start need to do, start to do more work on health. We need to open up this space. We need to explore how to, you know, do, it, it doesn't matter what it is because actually there were multiple things they could do because when they saw the map, they could think about, okay, we need to improve sanitation. We need to improve access to health services. We need to think about what sort of health insurance could happen in these spaces. Um, mm. And then they do that in an in action research group. So then they take that knowledge and then they work iteratively through those issues and see over time how that starts to impact on the bonded labor situation. Mm. Um, Another example would be a um, process that we worked on in Myanmar, same sort of approach in terms of the methodology, started with the life stories, and we worked with um, uh, community organizations in the north of Myanmar around conflict. Um, and just to give a, uh, an example of just one tiny corner of that, um, one of the issues that they identified was tensions between the um, refugee camps and the local host communities and villages. Um, they explored that together and they decided that the, the, the best starting point was just to bring some young people that they saw as, as the sort of the catalyst for this conflict from both of those two communities together. And those, uh, those dialogues took off in such a sort of potent way that they, they created new youth groups that had never actually happened in that part of Myanmar before across the whole of Kachin mm -hmm. and, uh, and ended up in creating a, a Kachin youth network that then fed into the Kachin Independence Organization, which is connected to the Kachin Independence Army, which is essentially the governing body there. But it basically just ripples from those meetings well beyond the control or even the site of the original action research groups mm -hmm. because from their analysis they saw the seed of something and they knew where to you know to use the gardening analogy they knew where to water it mm -hmm. yeah. uh, they didn't know where it would go yeah. but it just took off yeah. and I think these sorts of examples just show that if, if you can see the systems yeah. not just the system but if you can see the systems and those critical points within the system where you can intervene then you can nurture that and then it can grow into something yeah. uh you won't be able to control it mm -hmm. but you can create change yeah no brilliant no that that's you're also speaking to something that that um, is something i often often feel that what people feel complexity is saying is it's all very complex and you've got to know everything or you won't know what to do and what you're demonstrating there which is something I, I often say is we're seeking patterns it's the patternings exactly it's all about looks sort of finding mechanisms to see the patterns yes see the macro patterns see them in the group see them through dialogue mm -hmm. and then think about you know what can we what what are the dynamics we're seeing in those patterns what seems to be working what doesn't maybe we can start to sort of build very very localized theories of change yes. you know, if we did this maybe this would happen okay let's just try it take a step let's see what did happen yeah and then we'll take the next step and so on yeah no it's it's a, it's a wonderful example of how if you understand the patterning you can start to um, theorize about how to intervene what might either strengthen or dissolve the patterns depending on which it is you you feel is needed so that they're, they're really exciting examples thank thank you for those 
So my, my third and, and final question is really trying to think about the, the future of, of complexity thinking. Um, I, I, it feels like the world is getting even more impacted by climate change, the pandemic, increasing inequality, populism, and so on. You know, we have many factors coming together, all of which don't seem to be taking us into a more positive direction. And I, I wonder, how do you feel a complexity framing and appro approach of participative action inquiry can help? What has it got to offer if, you were, if we were trying to persuade other people that this has a real value in the world right now? I mean, I think one of the, I mean, most obvious responses is that um, things are so fast moving mm -hmm. that you can't actually go with a traditional planning model because by the time you've, you know, even written it down, it's out of date. Mm -hmm. If you could before, which you probably couldn't anyway, mm -hmm. and we, we've got hundreds of examples of how planning, you know, classical planning models just fail, mm -hmm. you know, whether they're because they're elite driven or because they're out, you know, they're, they're, too out of date by the time they're enacted but in this world where you know things can be different tomorrow to how they were yesterday then you need iterative emergent processes mm -hmm. so iterative emergent process to respond to an iteratively changing emergent world if you don't do that i think you're sunk yes yeah, really. yeah. so i would say that's the sort of the headline and most obvious response but i think there are others i think for example in a world where um it's hard to actually know what is real and what isn't. Yeah. And it's actually really important to engage with uh, the real people on the ground who are actually doing things. So processes, for example, that generate collective meaning making, mm -hmm. where people can listen to each other's stories that can assess the reality together, mm -hmm. to think through solutions together in context where they can actually see this is what's happening because she's telling me that or he's telling me or that's what they've been through mm -hmm. reconnecting to the human side of things and then turning that into evidence which is collectively owned and if it's collectively owned then it can then turn into action mm -hmm. is much more important right now than a bunch of uh, information that appears on whatever internet channel you're looking at or social media platform because you've no idea whether it's true and actually even if you're a really good trained investigative journalist it's actually sometimes quite hard to work out where things come from yeah. and whether they're whether they're true or not so I think there's something about needing a different sort of process to be able to cut through this yeah yeah, no, definitely. I was also thinking, going back to to your earlier points, that in working with with groups of people, um, looking at collective meaning making, it is essentially it is necessarily systemic. So they don't separate their economic decisions from their social decisions from their environmental decisions. It is a systemic world worldview way of looking at things, where those things are automatically interwoven into um, exactly. what you're seeing. So if you look at the sort of the narrative in the UK about business and you know whether, whether business is going to survive and what the economy is versus public health and all the rest of it you're right it's absolutely segmented in a sense yeah. whereas the work we're doing with on worse forms of child labor in Bangladesh you know you're talking about the family that has faced a, co a complete collapse in the supply chain and the implications of that in their slum community in their informal work place and work setting there's no work but at the same time covid is is both ravaging through their community in a health sense and having those economic impacts mm. and the issue is how do i survive all of that yeah yeah and it's all interconnected and interwoven yeah and then you've got the government coming in with lockdowns or not lockdowns and yeah um it, it's a messy complex process and they have to work out how to navigate it and there's no you know this strand or that strand Yes, yeah. No. As, exactly as you say. Yeah. And, and my final um, question, I, I guess, is, is along the lines of if you had several million pounds right now, you know, to, to push forward the, the subject matter of complexity and, and, um, and systemic action research, what's needed? How do we keep these subjects alive and moving forward in the world? Um, I mean, my, my overall sort of take on all of this is that um, we're engaging in a, um, a very mechanistic sort of uh, machine model uh, 
world where people are looking for linear outcomes. And it's very difficult to challenge that unless we can model alternatives. And it's very difficult to challenge that in the real world unless we can show that our alternative models actually mean something mm -hmm. to the real world. So, so my feeling is that the more money is invested in, doesn't matter whether it's the sort of process that I'm engaged in or others are engaged in, but on the ground, which shows how this sort of complexity work can create transformative change. Yes. Yeah. The more important it is, because I think, you know, we've got to the stage where in a sense, the theory will develop inevitably, but we know enough. Mm, yes. Um, what we need to do is show how that actually impacts in the world. Yes, yeah, no. Um, so it doesn't matter, again, whether it's work like we're doing on worse sons of child labour or conflict or increasingly cr critical. It's going to be work around, you know, the pandemic, or, as you say, or more important, climate change. Yeah. Um, but how do, we, how do we do that? You know, there are, there are, you know, real complex things emerging from the pandemic. Flights haven't happened. They've modelled something different. Mm -hmm. um, there is still a huge consumer drive for um, holidays abroad, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so on and so forth. There are new technologies evolving very fast or not. Mm -hmm. There are, you know, countries that are being ravaged by the, you know, the impacts of climate change on, on temperatures and crops and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So... You know, we need to be able to make sense of that really fast. Yes, yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, projects in the climate change space mm -hmm. using participatory and uh, systemic and complexity based thinking are, are, for me, the absolute number one priority. Yes, because we're, we're, we're facing a kind of political worldview um, that is, is mechanistic. And uh, as, um, as, as I know you and I have uh, discussed, you know, see, seeing, um, seeing development as, as a kind of sideline for foreign policy, where you, you put money where there's a, there's a kind of foreign policy advantage, but not to actually help people is, is a, a very sad and short-sighted um, way of approaching things and there is an opportunity to show that actually doing this this kind of systemic transformative work is is going to help the globe and uh, is going to help us all. Well and it's seeing the big picture and I also think that's one of the things that complexity thinking allows you to do and systems thinking is see the big picture because in the end you know for example I can spend and have spent much of the last three or four years working on worse forms of child labour and then a pandemic can happen and it can undo all of the work that we've been doing for decades. Yes. Well, climate change happens and it's going to make the pandemic look like a, a, a picnic in the park. Yes, yes. And then it, so it, it raises those deeper questions about how do you prioritize mm. you know, yeah. what needs to happen now? And I mean, it's, it's clear to me that it, it has to be a lot of climate change now. Otherwise, all of the other work that we're doing in development yeah. is going to be put in the universe. Yeah. Well, brilliant, Dunnit. That was so interesting and I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much.